just wish they'd come home. I love them and forever in my heart and on my mind. I just want everyone to know to love your children and hold them close because the next moment they could be gone. I just want to say that I'm not going to give up on my sons. I'm not going to give up until they come home. These Saskatchewan parents miss their kids and they're not alone. According to recent statistics from the provincial government, more than 3,000 kids were in care as of September 2018. Seventy percent of them identified as indigenous. I seen my child being removed the same way, same style, and I also uh, it's back to the student resident days, and I, I feel that for her because she's asking, she's looking, and then uh, it really hurts uh, where it counts. We can't tell you who they are. It's against the law to identify people in the system because it may identify their kids. It's an absolute ugly uh, moral issue that is being, uh, being hidden from the rest of us in society. And, and we should take the time to listen to our, our First Nation brothers and, 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 and Métis people and understand that harm that's being done, because it, it is huge. Tim Corll is a former deputy minister in the Child Welfare Department of Saskatchewan. He says he saw too many Indigenous kids going into care in his time. They, there's intimidation and uh, they'll make people uh, jump through hoops. They're just, they are actual hoops where uh, it really doesn't, it does nothing for the parenting of the, of the, of the parent, but as a reward for, 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 for participating in, in, in the directions of the social worker, the reward is, we'll give you your child back. I had seen all of this that we were actually uh, putting children in danger, but not only that, we were stealing their childhood. And I felt that myself as um, a, a top executive in, in the government that saw this, that I had a moral obligation to speak out and, and let people know that this was going on. Um, that in fact, what all these the parents and, and uh, children are, when they speak about um, the problems they're having with social services, it's true. And, uh, and I witnessed that myself from a perspective at the top of the organization. He invited APT and investigates to come to Saskatoon and see for ourselves. We accepted that invitation and met with parents who are working hard at programs designed to help get their children back. Two men agreed to tell us their stories. We'll call this man Jeff. I just, I just want her to be able to have her dad so I can love her and give her the opportunities. A stranger won't do that. A foster home won't do that. You know, other people, they don't really care as much as you care about your own. And that's why I want her with me. His child has been away from him for just under a year. For him, it's devastating. I promised her that I would never be her side. And she questions why I'm not with her. So what it's doing is it's causing her to have trust issues or abandonment issues. And now she has nothing but strangers around her. And she's just got no love. We're talking about a child that isn't given love. 
when somebody wants to love her, her own dad wants to love her. I always say, give her back, a long time ago. I've been saying give her back from the day it took place, and that's 10 months ago. That's six graduations on parenting program. That's at least 10 court cases where they had nothing on me, and they never did, and they never will. He and a father we'll call Adam are handing out posters for an event here in Saskatoon in late December, right before Christmas. Adam's story is just as sad. Well, she's actually being traumatized, same way as I was when I was back in uh, residential school. So they're creating their own system uh, back in, the, in a different form, only they have rules and regulations now. As back in the day, in my days, uh, it was just taken right off the reserve and they were kept in residents for uh, 10 months out of the year. And when I was a police officer in Saskatoon, I, I still lived out there. Tim Coral says he's heard these stories all the time while in government, but one stuck with him. Uh, Evander Daniels was killed in, in foster care. And that was would have been something that uh, I feel I would have I would definitely prevented. I was working out of the Saskatoon office where where, where Vander's case was. I I would not have allowed the apprehension, and I would not have allowed the placement that occurred. And uh, I regret that to this day. Evander Daniels was a 22-month-old who died in foster care. Very cruel. Very cruel what happened to uh, Abander. Uh, his, his death was horrific, a horrific death. Um, he was scalded quite bad. And uh, nobody had the compassion in the system to tell the family um, what, what had happened. So when they went to the uh, funeral home to uh, identify young Abander, that's when they were told that they couldn't because of the burns on his body. When social workers advised uh, the mother that um, that young Evander had died, she was overcome by grief, and uh, they had done this outside, and she had actually fallen down and and was quite hysterical, as you can imagine. Yet their response was, "We're going to call the police and get you arrested." And it just shows the cruel and inhuman care that can occur in these situations. And Evander isn't unique. He's unique in that we can talk about it and say, and we can point to it and say, look at, this is how these people are treated. His foster mother, Eunice Woodridge, was charged with criminal negligence causing death. She was acquitted, but passed away in 2014. Evander's death prompted calls for change to the system. Jeff says things have to change. They're just stealing, kidnapping and stealing a child by color of law, and making it look appropriately legal in the best interest of the child, when that is not what it is. It's an ideology to cover up a money machine, the same one that went from residential to the 60s scoop. And today we call it foster care. It should include new Coming up after the break, a new federal law may change how First Nations kids are apprehended. I am very excited and very hopeful with that process. It's the only way it can happen.
Here at the Central Urban Métis Federation, Inc., or Comfy as it's known locally, about three dozen parents show up at the event. It's been organized by former Assistant Deputy Minister of Child Welfare, Tim Quarles. Uh, to share their stories, each person takes a ribbon if they want to speak. We can't show you anything about the town hall because it would break the law. But the stories we collected here are devastating. I'm their mother. I want to be there for them. I want to be able to hug them and hold them and tell them I love them and tell them everything will be okay. And I, don't, I can't even tell them that. I'm scared for my child because I was raised in the foster care system. I was sexually abused and molested in those homes. I was abused by foster parents and by the workers in those homes and care homes and that. I don't want my child to be treated like that. I don't that worry as a parent um, is always constant for, your, for the kids you do not have or that you cannot see. I, um, that you wish, that you long to see and hold. I was in foster care once, and that sad, lonely feeling that you get when you, your parents aren't around, when you're in these strangers' place. Oh. I, I know that feeling. I was that little boy that, that didn't know if his parents were, were thinking of him or if, if anyone was even looking for him, if anyone even knew he was missing. I just wish they would stop putting um, stumbling blocks in front of me. Everything I do doesn't seem to be good enough for them to bring my daughter back to me. I'm, I'm worried my daughter's losing her spirituality and her culture in there. She, it's like, like um, sterilizing her to be in the white way rather than living with her, her true native family and to pull the family apart and rip them apart the way they have. I believe it's affecting them emotionally. It has to. Um, I don't think anybody growing up in a foster home would live to be happy. And not being able to see their family. They belong somewhere and then they belong with us. These families are in pain. As Comfy President Shirley Ibister explains, these parents are at the very beginning of a long journey. So this first picture shows the child taken and you can just see the pain in them because the children are gone so it's like residential school or like children being apprehended. And this next one depicts the time of healing for families and for a community. And that next one is coming home so the children are coming home you can see her standing there and so many people have came down here and just sat here and stared at them and and got meaning from them her organization is trying to guide them it's her life's work rooted in her own experience growing up Métis in Saskatchewan but I was raised in poverty and you know with poverty comes a lot of dysfunction and lack of opportunities and and people just, uh, you have to worry about uh, a roof over your head and food on the table for the kids so you don't uh, think about, I mean, education isn't a priority, you know, work isn't a priority because your whole day is spent trying to make sure your children are fed. She's worried about proposed federal changes to child welfare legislation. My agenda is not political. My agenda has always been um, the families, the children and the families. And unless there is a solid plan in place, it's just money. In fact, her agenda is right there, written on the wall. Mother to moms and cook them to children. In December 2017, then Minister of Indigenous Services, Jane Philpott, called the number of Indigenous children in care a humanitarian crisis. The federal government held an emergency meeting with the national leaders in January of 2018. 
and committed to six points of action including shifting program focus to prevention and early intervention, advancing culturally appropriate reform and developing a data and reporting system. But in January 2019, the cabinet was shuffled. Phil Pot was out. According to new Minister of Indigenous Services, Seamus O'Regan, the pedal is to the metal. Everything will go as planned. I mean, we hope to have that legislation introduced very shortly into the House of Commons. So uh, we don't see much need for any delay. In fact, most of my time right now has been making sure that I assure uh, Indigenous leadership that nothing is slowing down. The, you know, the pedals to the metal on all fronts. A lot of good work has been done under Minister Phil Pott over the past year and a half, and I don't plan on slowing anything down. So it means a fairly steep learning curve, and uh, I've been working in partnership with Indigenous leadership from across the country to make sure that I understand their priorities directly from them, and then we proceed. Federations of Sovereign Indigenous Nations, Chief Bobby Cameron said it's about time. Just said uh, This has been a long time coming to uh, finally getting the federal government on board to First Nation Child Welfare jurisdiction for First Nations. It's been a long time coming, and we're thankful. We're 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 optimistic. Uh, so let's not let this sit idle for the next couple of years. We need to get together now. We need to implement it now. Uh, we have our agencies, our technicians out there already creating a plan. So to, mini to the uh, message to Minister Philpott and Prime Minister Trudeau and others, this work is coming. Let's not wait, because there are children in the system that are that are thinking about suicide. There are children in the system that are going to be out of the system and either into the gang lifestyle or into jail and penitentiaries. Let's save them. Tim Corral says that the Saskatchewan child welfare system, he remembers, should change to Indigenous-centered. I saw a systemic racism that I didn't even think existed in, in modern day. Um, and it, it was it, it was actual it, it's brutality and it, it really shook me to the core um, emotionally that we would allow something like this to happen in uh, in a place like Saskatchewan oh, medicine wheel is that what that is Coral was stripped of his job in 2009 but went on to become a powerful advocate for families caught up in the system the First Nation people and the Métis people have something that our social services system doesn't have, and it's love, and it's kin, and, and the recognition of the hurt that's, that's been done. So they understand the problem, and that's the first thing you need to do with any problem is understand it. They totally get it. They totally understand it. They have kin in the game. And I, I think it is the only way. I'm extremely, I'm extremely positive. The Saskatchewan government declined a request for an interview. Cindy Blackstock, a pioneering child welfare advocate, is taking a wait and see approach to the new federal legislation. At this point, I've got um, some cautious optimism. I'm glad that the federal government has begun to listen to the call from First Nations for First Nations legislation. Um, although in this case it's Indigenous and I worry about um, them broadening it so wide that it doesn't meet the needs of any of the distinct groups. I think that can be problematic. We'll have to wait and see how much it respects First Nations jurisdiction within that context. According to Blackstock, it's hard to know what is coming down because the First Nations have not been involved in developing the legislation. So none of us know what's going to be tabled by the Department of Justice. She says without consultation, it's hard to know how the legislation could be successful. The Department of Justice and Indigenous Services Canada do not have people who are trained in child welfare, who've worked in First Nations communities, and know what needs to be done in terms of a broad legislative framework to support people on the ground to helping children and their families. Like Shirley Ivester, she says the situation is more complex than just fixing the child welfare system. You need to get at the drivers of the overrepresentation of First Nations kids in care. And we've known for decades what those are. 
It's parental mental health issues, often linked to uh, trauma from residential schools, 60 scoop or colonialism. The other piece is addictions, poverty, and poor housing. If we were able to get a grip on those, we would be able to really help strengthen families. And when we have strengthen families, the number of children in care will go down naturally. These parents are trapped in a current system and the future is uncertain while they wait for their kids to come home. Coming up next week on APTN Investigates, it's still their right to be able to pray. Their lack of access to Aboriginal spiritual care. And all the negativity that's in here cooped up and uh, when you're allowed to smudge you can release all that.